and what once by now must seem like the system that will never go away, we finally get to finish up the nervous system by discussing the special senses. Now, all along, we have mentioned some general senses. Whether or not we pointed them out as general senses or not, we've talked about them. Deep touch, light touch, pain, vibration, basically things that you can sense through the integument. Changes in temperature and such. Special senses involve specialized structures and they're usually around the head and the face. Smell, vision, hearing, balance, but balance as it applies to the inner ear. So as we look at these topics, we have to understand the nature of some of these receptors. And we have to know some of the pathways for the mechanisms that involves the structure of the receptor itself, as well as some of the neural pathways to get from the receptor to the association area that would perceive that particular sensation. Receptors in general continuously monitor changes in internal and external environment. And some of them can be extremely simple structures, like our nociceptors for pain. Others can be extremely sophisticated, as we will see when we look at the eye. We can classify them in a number of different ways by the modality of the stimulus. What is that receptor actually detecting? We'll talk about chemoreceptors. Chemoreceptors is probably the most uh, uh, persistent receptor you'll talk about in AMP2. A chemoreceptor is a receptor that will detect the presence of a particular chemical. So in AMP2, think about all of the things that will be in blood composition. Glucose levels, blood gases, oxygen, carbon dioxide, pH changes. All of the electrolytes, sodium, potassium, magnesium, cal everything. If it's a solute in the blood, it can be detected in their levels by specific chemoreceptors. We have thermoreceptors. Now, thermoreceptors are a little different than what most people think. We don't have hot receptors and cold receptors to detect absolute temperature. What we do detect is relative changes in temperature, which is why you can slip into a hot tub and it will feel extremely hot as you're slipping in. And then you acclimate to that temperature. And if you leave that hot water now and go to room temperature water, that water will then feel extremely cold. So you're always detecting the relative change in temperature. Photoreceptor, the most notable one we'll talk about will be the eye, is detecting light. You can have modified versions of photoreceptors when it comes to producing vitamin D when UV light hits the skin. But the most sophisticated one we'll talk about will be using the eye to interpret intensity and wavelength of light to give us that perception of vision. Mechanoreceptors detect mechanical change, deformation in the tissue. So we mentioned general sensations like deep touch and light touch. You run your fingers over even something very minimal like a braille writing, and it's still deforming the tissue in the skin and the fingertips. That slight compression and distortion of those mechanoreceptors detects the degree of touch. Baroreceptors are going to be a type of mechanoreceptor, except baroreceptors are specifically going to be detecting pressure. You've heard the term barometer before. There's where the prefix for our baroreceptor is going to wind up coming from. You'll talk about baroreceptors when you talk about blood pressure regulation in AMP2. And last up is the nociceptor. Now, this is what we're going to consider our pain receptor. And just to talk about pain uh, just momentarily, realize pain is a perception. 
Well, that sounds philosophical. But the only place you perceive pain is going to be in the parietal lobe of the brain, right? Nociceptors are very simple receptors that detect tissue damage and the chemical changes associated with it. If you damage tissue and you set off these nociceptors, a signal will be sent up the cord on its way to the parietal lobe. However, there's a number of different places along the way where we can block that particular signal. If that signal doesn't reach the parietal lobe, you don't perceive it as pain. Now, to look at little nuances of this, we are going to start using the term nociception for the perception of pain that is accompanied with tissue damage. You'll see some references refer to it as true pain. You can also have what's called non-nociceptive pain, the perception of pain without tissue damage. Think about people who have a migraine and we shine a bright light in their eyes. The pain intensity increases, but there is no nociceptor stimulus. We're simply overstimulating other receptors. Somebody who has chronic pain, an ankle injury so many years ago, that injury lasted a long time. Now there is no ongoing nociception or nociceptor stimulation coming from the an ankle, but you are continuously perceiving the pain. That's due to rewiring of the neurons in the brain, and basically you get this reverberating circuit repetitively stimulating the, the pain centers. You know, you take that concept a little bit further and you look at what's called phantom limb pain. Now that ankle is amputated at the knee. It's not even there anymore. Yet the person can still sense ankle pain. So that centralized pain is non-nociceptive. Now, whenever we're dealing with any of those general sensations, we're looking at that pathway very similar to what we saw with our the sensory half of our reflex. Up the spinal nerve, in the posterior aspect of the cord, it will synapse with the secondary neuron, and this time that secondary neuron will ascend the cord on its way to the parietal lobe. You have a great deal of visceral sensations as well. Remember, chemoreceptors in the blood vessels, sending signals to areas in the brainstem that's meant to monitor various blood levels. We can classify receptors in two ways, and we're not looking to take, say, that this type of receptor falls in this category and that type of receptor falls in this category. These are two different ways we can perceive receptor function. Some receptors are more tonic, meaning that if we apply a stimulus to that receptor, as long as the stimulus is present, the receptor will detect the presence of the stimulus. Great for detecting stimuli that do not fluctuate. Phasic receptors are only going to be effective at sensing a stimulus that is changing. So if we look at the diagram down here at the bottom left, we apply a stimulus and we leave it constant. We initially get a perception. But the longer that stimulus stays static, the lower the amplitude of perception we achieve. It phases out over time. Now we change the stimulus just a little bit and then we immediately get a quick response again. So phasic receptors are going to be considered the receptor of dynamic change. Because if a static stimulus stays present for a period of time, we simply stop perceiving it as intensely. We consider that adaptation. That's similar to the concept of what I was talking about earlier when you slip into a hot tub. Those would be 
phasic receptors detecting that temperature change. The temperature of the water has to cool down, but you've acclimated to it. So now let's apply some of that specifically to our special senses. The first one that we get to is the sense of taste, gustation. Type of chemoreceptor embedded in the taste buds of the tongue. Cranial nerve 7, cranial nerve 9. Now, a lot of resources will take the tongue and kind of map it out into, you know, even this diagram here, bitter along the back perimeter, sweet on the tip, sour down the outside, uh, anterior. These mappings aren't exactly accurate. And if you looked up 10 different examples of it, you would probably see 10 slightly different mappings. But we do consider that anything that you perceive as a descriptive taste is a combination of the five main taste sensations. Salty, sweet, sour, bitter, and umami. The first four, you probably can perceive what they mean without much description. Umami is one that most people have not heard of. It's a savory taste. Think about the taste of roast chicken, for example. And it's because of the unique nature of that taste that a lot of people will use chicken as a reference for what other things might taste like. It's not the fact that chicken is common, but chicken is a great example of that umami uh, taste sensation. When we look at where these taste buds are located, we do see particular structures. We tend to see valate across the back. Now, ironically, that's where we had most of those mappings showing bitter. We had fungiform around the tip, usually where we taste sweet. So rather than think of we taste sweet with the tip of the tongue, we taste bitter along the back margin of the tongue, you know, it would be more reasonable to start to picture this as different structures of taste buds are going to be more adapted to detecting specific types of chemicals that might be salty or might be sweet. Remember, cranial nerve 7, cranial nerve 9. Cranial nerve 7 detecting taste from the anterior two-thirds of the tongue. Cranial nerve 9 entering the receptors from the posterior third. We will see those primary neurons extend back in the nucleus solitarius of the medulla oblongata. It's going to be a nuclei for those primary neurons in the brainstem. Then we will see a synapse. Secondary neurons will proceed to the thalamus. Now, we didn't mention the thalamus when we looked at our different parts of the brain because we knew we were going to get to it here. The thalamus is a very involved relay station when it comes to perceived sensation. Virtually any stimuli that makes its way to the parietal lobe of the brain passes through at least a part of the thalamus first. And that's what we see here with our first example of a special sense. Primary neurons leaving the tongue, proceeding back to the nucleus tractus solitarius, synapsing with a secondary neuron heading to the thalamus. Tertiary neurons now will travel from the thalamus to the primary gustatory cortex of the cerebrum. Now, we hadn't mentioned that particular cortex because it's a little deeper than the superficial anatomy we looked at prior. If we were to look at a lateral view of the brain and kind of pull apart the border of the temporal lobe with the frontal and the parietal lobe, the insula would be in that crevice. And that's where we would see the primary gustatory cortex. Next up is olfaction, cranial nerve one, also a chemoreceptor. This time we will see very fine nerve endings extend out into the nasal mucosa, detecting particulates that have been inhaled. <laughs> 
when we look at the structure, we kind of remember back to our skeletal structures. We had our ethmoid bone with the cribriform plate. Remember any time you looked at the sheep brain, you had that olfactory bulb extending out underneath the frontal lobe. Again, relate that to your skull structure. This olfactory bulb would sit right on top of the ethmoid bone. All those little fine pinholes in the cribriform plate of the ethmoid bone are passageways for those very fine nerve endings olfaction. So we get our olfactory receptor cells supported by supportal and basal cells and then extending up through that cribriform plate. Now, we can picture that the brain inside the cranium has some wiggle room, right? It's because of that, that sense of smell is one of the easiest sensations to lose. Head trauma, whether it be uh, one significant head trauma or multiple micro traumas, it's like a boxer, you will get a repetitive shearing between the olfactory bulb and the cribriform plate, damaging these very fine nerve endings. Now, I guess out of all the sensations that you have, if you had to choose one to give up, I think most people would probably give up smell. We associate smell actually more so with unpleasant uh, odors. Yes, we can picture things we like to smell that are nice, but how do you know if you're not smelling something? We relate a lot of smell into our taste sensation. Now, I know you've heard that before. Even though we perceive odor in a complete different place than taste, association areas connecting those two make smell an intricate part of what we taste. So people that lose sense of smell, they don't often uh, show up at your physician's office complaining, hey, I can't smell something. They usually complain that food doesn't taste right anymore. If we look at the underside, well, you're just looking at a sheep brain in the lab, here is our olfactory bulb extending posterior to our olfactory tract. Here on the underside is where that ethmoid bone and the cribriform plate would be located. Synapses from our primary neurons in that olfactory bulb extend to neurons that proceed back the olfactory tract until they get to the olfactory cortex of the temporal lobe. So two sensations down, both examples of chemoreceptors, both rather simple in their design. Now we get to one of the more complex structures, the eye, sense of vision, cranial nerve two, the optic nerve. Here we have photoreceptors that together are going to detect light intensity, sometimes be able to perceive different wavelengths of light, which really means color. We are going to divide our receptors up into two main types. There are going to be subtypes. We don't need to get into it to that depth. Rods versus cones. When we differentiate rods versus cones, there's a couple of things that we have to take into consideration. First, the threshold of stimulus. Now, that's a, a fancy way of saying how intense does the light have to be before these receptors are triggered. Rods have a very low threshold of stimulus. They don't need very much light to work. Cones have a much higher threshold of stimulus. And if we don't hit that light intensity, those cones will not fire. So when you walk into a dimly lit room, your rods are what you're primarily going to be using as a receptor for your sense of vision as you kind of fumble around in the dark. Next up is what they're able to distinguish. Rods, with their low threshold of stimulus, functions very much like an on-off switch. 
they are detecting a stimulus or they are not. They don't do much to deduce the nature of that stimulus. Cones, however, once you hit that threshold of stimulus, they are able to detect and differentiate between different wavelengths of light. And if you weren't aware, the wavelength of the light is what dictates color. We take sunlight and we pass it through a prism, a piece of crystal. Different wavelengths bend as it passes through that crystal at different angles. So we take that white sunlight, we pass it through a crystal, the different wavelengths will now will separate as they refract at different angles, and we get a rainbow. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. Wavelengths that are below red are considered infrared. We can't see them. The cones cannot detect those wavelengths of light. We can detect them down to what we perceive as red. Wavelengths of light that are a higher frequency than violet are ultraviolet. Again, we can't perceive those either. So we, we wind up thinking from the red to the violet, that is your spectrum of visual light. The third difference between the rods and the cones is going to be where we see them located. And the fourth difference will be which one plays a greater role in visual acuity. Now, to discuss items three and four, we kind of have to look at the structure. So remember, the first two differences between the rods and the cones. Rods had a low threshold of stimulus, cones had a high. Rods, black, white, and shades of gray, cones could distinguish between color. The location in the eye is going to be different. We'll get to that. And one of them is going to be deeply involved with the sharpness of image. We'll get to that. First, let's look at the structure of the eye. To keep it relevant to sensation and light detection, we have two transparent structures. We have our cornea and we have our lens. We are going to use the lens and change its dimensions in order to focus light directly on the posterior aspect of the orbit. Surrounding the aperture where light enters is going to be your ciliaris muscle making up the iris. Through constrictions and dilations of what we know as the pupil, we can control the amount of light that proceeds to enter the eye. If we look at the back of the eye, we can, or any of the eye really, we can divide it up into three layers a fibrous tunic, a vascular tunic, and a neural tunic, which will contain the retina. The fibrous tunic is the entire white of the eye, including the cornea that extends out anteriorly. That is primarily there to provide shape for the eye. In order to be able to see images with very sharp detail, we rely very heavily on the ability of our lens to take that incoming light and hit the focal point exactly where our photoreceptors happen to be. We would have an awful hard time regulating that distance if the eye changed shape easily. We rely on this fibrous tunic to maintain shape. As people get older and they get those age-related changes in vision, very often it's because of, over time, distortions of the eye. The eye has slightly changed shape. Now the lens can no longer reach that same focal length. 
just under the fibrous tunic, we have our vascular tunic. As the name implies, this is going to be the layer with a lot of blood vessels. And if you have the opportunity in lab to look in each other's eyes, maybe we can't do that right now because of the pandemic is still raging. But if you were to look in someone's eye, you would see it's extremely vascular in there. You will see a nice, intricate network of blood vessels. As that extends around the front, the vascular tunic also includes the iris, those pupillary and dilator muscles. But what we're mostly interested in is the neural tunic. This is where we find our photoreceptors in the retina. So anywhere here where we see yellow is part of the retina. When we look at the retina, we can divide it down a little bit more. We'll see that the retina also has a pigmented layer. That's there to absorb light. The last thing we want is light penetrating through the neural layer where the photoreceptors are and then reverberating off it like a basketball hitting a backboard. We want light to pass through that retina in one direction and then stop. So the light will pass through the tissue that includes our photoreceptors. It will hit our pigmented layer and it will be absorbed. No refraction, no reflection. When we look at the organization of the neural layer, we see multiple neurons involved with its structure. Our rods and our cones are going to be at that deepest layer. Very short neurons associated directly with the receptors. They will synapse with bipolar cells, also short, and then they will synapse with a third neuron on the, lining the inside of the eye. Those neurons will proceed to eventually form the optic nerve leaving the back of the eye. So we immediately, as soon as we stimulate our rods and or our cones, we immediately get synaptic activity along two different borders of that retina. So now let's look at those two other differences that we were talking about between the rods and the cones. Remember we had the threshold of stimulus was different. The ability to detect color was different. We also said location was different. And we said visual acuity detection was different. When it comes to location, we see cones most closely concentrated at the macula lutea and the central fovea. There's an indented portion at the back of the retina. And it is going to be the place that if we were to have light come straight through that eye, that's where the light would hit. That's where we see most of our cones. The further we get from that point, the concentration of cones decreases and the concentration of rods are going to increase. If we look at that, if we're looking into the eye, this is looking straight into someone's eye. Here is your central fovea as part of your macula lutea. There is where most of your cones are going to be. And the further we get from that central spot, the fewer cones we're going to wind up having. And as we reach the periphery of the retina, you will essentially see no cones whatsoever. Now, that is part of the equation on why cones are the main photoreceptor involved with visual acuity, the sharpness of image. A visual acuity test, most of us have taken them. It's when you, you sit in an optician's office and you 
look at the big poster with the big E on the top and the progressively smaller lines of text. Snell and I chart. In order for you to read the small lines, you have to have great visual acuity, great sharpness of image. Now, in order for you to have great sharpness of image, you're going to need the least distorted light as possible. Anytime you pass light through any medium, you're going to get some distortion. Unless it passes through at directly a perpendicular angle. So here's the plane of our lens. Up and down. Any light that hits that lens on an angle is going to be refracted. Bent. So we have the plane of our lens. Light approaches from this angle and it gets bent. The only place where light will not undergo any degree of deformation as it passes through the lens is if it approaches the lens perfectly perpendicular. And if it does, it hits at the central fovea. So part of the reason why cones are great for visual acuity is it's opportunistic in that manner. It happens to be concentrated at the area where we see the least distorted light hit the retina. Now, you can prove this to yourself right now by picking something in the room you're in and staring at it. And you can probably see exactly what you're staring at very, very crisply, very, very sharply. Now, don't take your focus off of what you're staring at, but appreciate your peripheral vision now. Without taking your eyes off what you're staring at, be conscious of the items around it. The further you get from what you're staring at, the more blurred the image becomes. Because light coming off of exactly what you're staring at is coming straight through the lens with minimal distortion and hitting the central fovea where the cones happen to be. Light entering from the left, right, top, and bottom and going through the lens is getting refracted before it hits the retina. We cannot make a sharp image out of refracted light. We can't make up for that distortion. So we have to gain the sharpness of image by concentrating our efforts on the least refracted and least deformed light as it passes through the lens. So that's the number one reason why cones are, are great for visual acuity. Opportunistic. They happen to reside right where the least deformed light hits the retina. Great. The second reason it's involved with a visual acuity is its synaptic ratios. When we look at the ratios and we look at the synaptic activity, we stimulate a receptor in the retina. It synapses with a bipolar cell. It synapses with a ganglion cell, and that heads back to the occipital lobe. When we compare the ratios of rods and cones, we see cones have a much closer to a one-to-one -one ratio. All of these rods here, these yellow ones, any combination of stimulating those rods might have the effect of only stimulating this single ganglion cell. So the occipital lobe that interprets what's coming from that ganglion cell doesn't know if all of these are stimulated, if one of them is stimulated, if any combination of them is stimulated because the information is dumbed down as we go from the receptor layer to the ganglion cells. Cones, however, maintain a much closer to a one-to-one -one ratio. Therefore, what we perceive at the retina can be interpreted at the occipital lobe with much greater detail. 
The last structure to point out is the optic disc. We see the optic nerve leave the back of the eye. The optic disc is going to be that portion inside the retina that has no receptors whatsoever. And if you, again, you look at what that eye looks like from the inside with the blood vessels, it'll also be the place where the blood vessels branch out from. Optic disc. Now, even though it's void of receptors, our brain fills it in. It takes what it's detecting at the rest of the retina and fills in that gap. Now, visually, we have our eye. We have our optic nerve leaving the eye and proceeding posteriorly. Here is our optic nerve, left and right. This is the only cranial nerve that we will see cross over and become bilateral on the surface. The optic nerve perceives posteriorly until we get to this crossing over. The crossing over is called the optic chiasm. Anything posterior to the optic chiasm is the optic tract. And that's where we get crossing over. So that our left occipital lobe gets innervation from both eyes. Our right occipital lobe gets innervation from both eyes. The last special sense we have to bring up is kind of a two in one. Hearing and equilibrium. Cranial nerve eight, the vestibulocochlear. Two completely different sensations carried by nerves in a common sheath. To look at the structures first and foremost, let's divide the ear up. External, middle, and inner ear. The external ear is what you would look at if you were looking in somebody's ear using an otoscope. Tubular structure, ear wax may be in here. At the far end of that tube, you will see your eardrum or tympanic membrane. Once you get past the tympanic membrane, on the other side is your middle ear. Middle ear has a drainage into the nasopharynx, the eustachian tube. And it will have three ossical bones inside. The inner ear is made up of the complex structure of the semicircular canals, vestibule, and cochlea. This is where we'll see the receptors for both hearing and equilibrium exist. So we're going to take hearing and equilibrium and talk about them separately. They're unrelated other than they share a cranial nerve and the structures are, are closely associated with one another physically. When we look at equilibrium, and we look at the entire inner ear structure, we can draw a line right across here. Everything on this side of the line has to do with balance and equilibrium. Everything over here in this spiral organ is for hearing. We can take that balance half of the inner ear and divide it up even more. We can divide it up into a vestibule and semicircular canals. Then we can take the vestibule and divide it up even further again to look at the utricle and the saccule. So let's go back to our diagram and have another look at that. We draw our line here. Everything north of that line is for vestibular sensation. Here's our semicircular canals. Each ear has a trio of them, each oriented in a different three-dimensional plane. 
we will talk about the semicircular canals as housing the receptors for dynamic head movement. Our vestibule is much more of a larger chambered structure made up of the utricle and the saccule. And we will talk about the vestibule as more so the part that houses three-dimensional awareness of position relative to gravity. When we look at the structures and we look at the, the vestibule first, what we witness is modified mechanoreceptors, very sophisticated mechanoreceptors. We see our receptor with several cilia extending off of its surface at different lengths. Those cilia don't just hang in space. They actually protrude into this gelatinous material. And that gelatinous material will have a crystalline structure embedded in it to give it some ballast, some weight. Picture as you look straight ahead, this otolithic membrane, that gelatinous structure, is sitting just as it does as we're picturing it on the diagram. What would happen if you tipped your head forward? The gelatinous structure will be pulled down by gravity and it would deform those cilia that are extending up into the gelatinous structure. The further the degree of head tilt, the more we deform our hair cell receptors. So we get an impression of head position relative to gravity. Now, the semicircular canals are similar, but distinctly different at the same time. We don't have this nice, broad, flat otolithic membrane. We do still have very similar looking cilia structures though. But this time, that gelatinous structure is not a broad, flat sheet. It's kind of this teardrop, tear, uh, shape. This is the cupula. The entire receptor structure is our Christi ampullaris. Those structures sit here at the enlarged base of our semicircular canals. And all along the tubular structure of our semicircular canals, we get this fluid called endolymph. So we got this endolymph fluid inside a tube that's a bony structure. As we turn our head, the bony structure moves immediately. The liquid portion tends to lag behind. As we stop our head, the bony structure stops immediately and the liquid component continues to move momentarily. It's that liquid movement relative to the bony structure the endolymph will kind of wash over the cupula as it flows back and forth based on head movement. And that's how we detect dynamic head movement. So again, our chin tucking. As you're moving your head down, the movement is sensed by our semicircular canals. If you were to stop moving at any point, the three-dimensional head position you are now in is going to be detected by our vestibule and our otolithic membrane. So both together giving us the total sensation of balance and coordination, one relative to movement, the other relevant to gravity. The only other structure that we have to talk about now is our 
spiral organ or organ of corti for hearing the other half of our inner ear now if we were to do a cross section here we would see it's kind of like a snail shell but really what we're looking at is one long structure just wound up <laughs> so do yourself a favor and already start picturing it as this elongated structure that happens to be coiled up for storage purposes this elongated structure is divided up into three regions. We have a scale of vestibuli, a scale of media, and a scale of tympani. The scale of media is where we will see our basilar membrane with our modified mechanoreceptors. In the remainder of those chambers, we see again fluid, endolymph and perilymph. Now this time we're not concerned with the movement of the fluid relative to head movement. But what we are going to do is take sound waves from the air and convert them into a vibration in this fluid that's then going to be detected as a vibration at this tectorial plate. This is going to be in our scale of media, remember? The vibrations in the endolymph will vibrate this tectorial membrane. And we will perceive that as a mechanical stimulation for, again, more hair cell structures and stereocilia extending out into that structure. So let's look at the process of it all. We see vibratory deformation of the airwaves. It enters the external ear and reverberates off our tympanic membrane. Remember those three bones we mentioned? Those act as gears. We have our malus. We have our incus and we have our stapes a little bit of movement at our tympanic membrane moves the malice a little bit which moves the incus a little bit more which moves the stapes a little bit more again on the end of the stapes we have another membrane the oval window associated with our scale of vestibuli we move the tympanic membrane, it moves the ossicle bones, it reverberates off the oval window, and it causes a vibration in the fluid of our scale of vestibuli. This is our elongated structure that's simply coiled up like a snail shell. All along our scale of media, we have our receptors. Now, Along the length here, stimulating receptors at different locations will give us different frequency of sound. We see high frequency vibrations not make it so far up the organ. So they're going to stimulate receptors at the introductory portion. The lower the frequency of the sound, the further up the organ it happens to be stimulating those hair receptors. So where along the organ of Corti we wind up stimulating will give us a perception of tone. The amplitude of the vibration gives us our volume. So we see the bending of those stereo cells as part of the tectorial membrane. They're going to make their way through our superior olivary nuclei for sound localization. We had our inferior olivary nuclei for body position. This is the superior olivary nuclei. 
We also mentioned the inferior colliculus for hearing reflexes. Some of those fibers or neurons are going to make its way there. Before it makes its way to the primary auditory cortex, we'll go through a part of the thalamus called the medial geniculate body. So again, multiple synapses to go from the receptor to where the hearing is actually going to be perceived. And of course, this is in the temporal lobe. So as far as what we need to know, focus on general terminology first. Chemoreceptor, photoreceptor, mechanoreceptor, tonic versus phasic. What a receptor actually is. Focus on that first. Then move into your special senses. Smell and taste. Handle those together. They're both types of chemoreceptors. The eye as a photoreceptor, you should understand the difference between the rods and the cones. We had our four differences. You should understand the, the pathway. Optic nerve, optic chiasm, optic tract. Then we did hearing and equilibrium. Tackle those separately. They are separate from each other. It's simply shared space that makes us discuss them together. Know the relevant structures of that inner ear that pertains to each one. And understand how we convert movement and position for equilibrium into a particular stimulus of our receptor. And same goes for hearing. How we translate vibration in the air into vibration in the fluid and what that means at the, the spiral organ. So with that, we finish up the nervous system completely. So we are just about done here now. If you have any questions, as usual, please feel free to reach out, and we will take the problems as they pop up.